Thank you everyone for coming today to our study group, which is about Yeshi Sogyol, her life and enlightenment. Before we begin, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about me. My name is Pema or Dallas, you can call me either one of those things. I'm the Buddhist chaplain with USQ's multi-faith service. I'm also a senior lecturer in writing, editing and publishing. I'm the co-director of Jalu Buddhist Meditation Centre, which is an online meditation centre. And I've been a Buddhist practitioner for about four decades. So I kind of think, and that's a picture of me looking somewhat grumpy. So when we begin um, in Buddhism, we always like to set our intention, um, which is sometimes called um, setting our motivation, or sometimes it's also called arousing bodhicitta, uh, which is the mind of uh, compassionate enlightenment. So we'll just take a moment to consider why we're here. Um, you can have the aspiration to benefit yourself um, or the, benef the aspiration to benefit others. Um, we're here to connect with our pristine nature, the true nature of mind, so that once we're free of disturbing emotions, we can help others to be free as well. So our intention um, for doing all Buddhist activity is to benefit others. And I'll just read a little bit from the Bodhisattva's Way of Life by Shantideva, who was an 8th century Buddhist monk and master from India. May I be a guard for those without one, a guide for all who journey on the road. May I become a boat, a raft or bridge for all who wish to cross the water. May I be an isle for those desiring landfall and a lamp for those who wish for light. May I be a bed for those who need to rest and a servant for all who live in need. As, as we set our intention, we can just sort of say to ourselves, if we like, may all beings be free of suffering. By this effort, may all beings be free of suffering or something like that. Or it can be a silent intention. So today we're talking about Yeshi Sogyol, her life and enlightenment. And because this is our first study group, um, I thought some of you might be wondering, and, I'm, and I've definitely got a few questions from the Colorado group asking, okay, so why in this first study group are we talking about Yeshi Sogyol? Um, there are more kind of foundational things that usually get done in a first sort of teaching or study group, um, such as the four thoughts that turn the mind or the eightfold path or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. But I thought um, we could start with Yeshi Sogyo because actually starting um, with um, Yeshi Sogyo is a good idea because it can be actually quite inspirational. And Yeshi Sogyo is the model of the perfect practitioner, the perfect disciple, and the perfect master. I've got those color coded, which will become clear why later. And so learning about Yeshi Sogyo's life and enlightenment will teach us view, meditation and conduct. So in the Dharma, those of you who've been around for a little while understand that when we talk about Dharma, we often talk about, particularly in the Dzogchen style of uh, teachings, we often talk about view, meditation and conduct. So we divide everything that we do up into those three things. And, um, and I've matched them up there so that when we're talking about Yeshi Sogyal as a perfect practitioner, that matches up with conduct. When we talk about Yeshi Sogyal as the perfect disciple, that matches up with meditation. And we, when we talk about Yeshi Sogyal as the perfect master, um, that matches up with view. I'll go over these in a little minute um, and make it clear what we're talking about here. Um, but I just thought I'd start off by saying that um, Usually, we enter the Dharma, usually, it's not always the case, usually we enter the Dharma because we're attracted to the idea of a peaceful mind, or we're attracted to the idea of learning to cope with our minds and our disturbing emotions. That's usually, as Westerners, what attracts us to the Dharma. But sometimes in the West, we're attracted for other reasons. And one of those reasons, and I think a reason that is, um, it actually gives quite a bit of juice to us on the path, is that we're inspired by other practitioners. So a lot of people have come to the Dharma, particularly the Tibetan Buddhist version of it, um, by being inspired by people like Holiness Dalai Lama, so they see Holiness Dalai Lama and think he's extraordinarily kind, he's generous, he's always happy. You know, I want a bit of that. And that brings them to the Dharma. 
So, and I think actually when we're inspired in that way and when we have a model, you know, a mentor as it were to, to fashion ourselves after, it actually can give our practice quite a bit of juice. It can actually keep us sustained because we can also then, as we go through learning meditation, learning how to live a more ethical life, learning how to deal with disturbing emotions, we can actually dip into the teachings of that mentor that we've chosen or dip into the life story of that mentor we've chosen. We can see them, you know, we can, if they're alive, we can see videos of them. We can read what they've written themselves. We can attend teachings with them. If they're not alive, we can read about their life. We can read also the teachings that they've left behind. Um, and it can be very inspiring, give, a, give the practice quite a lot of juice. Inspiration is an important part of the inner journey. So that's why I chose Yeshi Sogil, I think because she's one of the most inspirational figures in Tibetan Buddhism. And I think actually in Buddhism in general, other than the Buddha himself, um, because she lived quite a difficult life and yet she achieved full enlightenment, which I think is pretty extraordinary. All right, so I'm just, um, as we begin, I just want to read this quote. Um, one of the things we'll learn in a minute is that a lot of the teachings that we have in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition are the result of Yeshi Sogyal's hard work. So Yeshi Sogyal, as the perfect disciple, recorded everything her master said, and Padmasambhava was her master. So he established Buddhism in Tibet in 750, around 750 AD or CE. Um, so she recorded everything he said, all of his teachings. Um, she had apparently a quite pr profoundly accurate memory. She wrote everything down and then she archived it all. So not only did she record everything her guru said, she then archived it all, you know, with keywords and stuff so that we could find, so that they were grouped into themes so that we could find teachings on specific matters um, that were relevant to us. And also she, she was a perfect um, disciple in that she asked a lot of the right questions and so a lot of what we have in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition particularly our school the Nyingma school um, is a result of her diligence and her asking the right questions at the right time and then recording the answers so so much of what we have comes down from her she is in no small way really um, the mother of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and as the first person to be enlightened in Tibet, the first Tibetan to become enlightened, she's really a great inspiration. So um, I just want to put this out here because a lot of you are female persons and there has been in the past um, and in other schools, not the Nyingma school, but in other forms of Buddhism, there can be some weirdness about gender, the idea that women are not equal to men. This is not true. It's something that's crept in a couple of hundred years after the Buddha passed into Parinirvana or passed away. The Buddha treated men and women totally equal. And in fact, there are examples where he favoured nuns over monks because their need was greater. So we know this by looking at all the teachings as a whole. Sometimes there are a few little things that say something opposite or something different. And we know that they don't fit with the teachings as a whole. So we know that they've crept in. They're what we call barnacles on the ship of the Dharma. <laughs> They're things that have been added by the culture in which the Dharma was recorded. But at the time Yeshi Sogyo became a practitioner in India at that time, there was a very strong um, thread of thinking that women were not equal to men and that to become enlightened, you had to actually be a man, which is of course ridiculous. And so Yeshi Sogyo asked Padmasam about this again, asking the right question, really, really important question for the future. Not for then, yes, very important, but for the future, deeply, deeply important. And this is Padmasambhava's response. And remember here, he's completely enlightened. And many Tibetans consider Padmasambhava to be the reincarnation of Shakyamuni Buddha himself. So this is no small lama, some mountain yogi saying this. This is someone who's considered the pinnacle of the Buddhist tradition. And he says, whether male or female, there is no great difference. But if a woman develops a mind bent on enlightenment, which we call bodhicitta, her potential is supreme. So there he's clearly saying that women actually have an advantage if 
they develop a mind bent on enlightenment, which is bodhicitta. So I thought because that statement is quite profound, I mean, we all understand as people growing up in a kind of Western developed world that men and women are equal. We kind of understand that. But in sometimes in religion, it doesn't, in practice, it doesn't play out that way, you know? But Padmasambhava is saying here, not only are men and women like equal, actually women might have an advantage. So we'll just, because this is really important for women and I think for the Dharma in general, I'm going to talk a little bit about what bodhicitta is so that we just know what he means here when he's saying, if women develop a mind bent on enlightenment, you know, which is bodhicitta, what, what, what does that really mean? What will give you as women an advantage? So this is again, a teaching from Pamasambhava, again, a teaching from Pamasambhava to Yeshi Sogyal. So we only have this teaching because Yeshi Sogyal asked, she asked the question and she wrote it down. So he says, about bodhicitta, cultivating loving kindness and compassion for all sentient beings. Cultivate loving kindness for all sentient beings. So a little thing popped up that's in my way here. I'll just move it. Constantly train yourself in bodhicitta. Now, bodhicitta tra translates as um, enlightened mind. Chitta is mind, bodhi is awakened or enlightened. So that's a little bit poetic. It doesn't really tell us what it means. What it means is a mind that has recognized its true nature and and rests in the pure compassion that is our true nature, right? And, and has the wisdom of emptiness. There's a lot of words there. Essentially, bodhicitta is the mind that rests in empty compassion, in emptiness and compassion as one, unified as one, okay? This will make sense um, as you practice. It makes more sense. So he says, but Pamasambhava says to you, Yeshi Sogyo, Train yourself to benefit sentient beings through all your actions. Train yourself in cherishing others as more important than yourself. Now, I'll, I'll pop a little proviso in there. We know that if you don't have a good feeling about yourself, you need to work on that first. Padmasambhava is assuming that we cherish ourselves more than others, which is the norm, you know. In the West, unfortunately, it's not the norm. So he's suggesting here that, you know, once we, if we are in an equal, you know, if we're in an equal position, then we should train in bodhicitta. Hang on, I'll just go back a step. Uh, how do I go back? Can I just ask whoever's making noise there to mute your, mute your microphones? Not sure who it is. Um, okay, so, and then he says, in short, the most essential point is that the determination of arousing bodhicitta must precede all the outer and inner practices and the stages of development and completion. Now, those meaning those words mean things to those who have been on the path a bit longer, outer and inner practices, stages of development and completion. They're referring to Tantra, so what we call Vajrayana in Tibetan Buddhism, or what is Tibetan Buddhism, you know, which usually is, you know, I'm going to go into this a little bit later, but it's really not terribly important that we understand that at this point. But essentially what he's saying is that all of these practices that people consider like really profound and high and special, you know, they can't be undertaken without bodhicitta, without the, com the compassionate intention. They just won't work without that. Okay. And then it says generation of bodhicitta is the very root of all Dharma practice. Remember bodhicitta is not just compassion. It's also this understanding of the understanding of the empty nature of things, right? The impermanent, unfixed, fluid nature of things. That's really important because compassion that, relies on the idea of you know fixed permanent things um is flawed it won't last and it actually often won't do any good so this is what he's saying um if if we and he's talking about women in particular um in the previous quote if we can do this if we can generate this bodhicitta then enlightenment will swiftly follow okay so I'm just going to play a little video here. This is a short, I think, five-minute video about, and we'll probably have technical issues, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt, um, about the life of Yeshi Sogyo. I just want to give you this little biography because I'm not going to talk much about her biography. Um, I want to focus more on her, um, her teaching lineage, like what she's left us, um, the great sort of like jewel of her wisdom that she's left for us to pick up and apply. So, but I think it is interesting to know 
the basics of her story. Now, Tibetans, when they write a biography, they focus on the mystical, spiritual, and supernatural more than on the factual, okay? So once we watch this, which has got quite a bit of mystical stuff in it, I'll talk about historically what we really know about her, like that. Historically, what are the facts that can be verified? So then, and both of these things I think are equally amazing, actually. Both stories are quite amazing. So I'll just play this now. Um, pop up your hands if you can't hear it once it starts. Okay, hang on. So you can't hear it, Kerry? Kerry, you're muted. You'll need to unmute yourself. I can hear you. You oh. can't hear the film. But play isn't pressed on the film. I stopped it when you put your hand up. Okay. So I'll try it again and then let me know if you can hear it. Okay. Could you hear that? It's very faint, but that might be my problem. Um, can I just ask um, Kylie, could you hear that clearly? No, it, it, like Carrie, it was very, very faint. I could only just almost hear it. Okay, I'll, I will crank the volume up. I'll see if I can do that. Hmm. Let me see. Just so you know, it's a visual thing. You actually don't need to hear it because <laughs> it's text on screen, really. Anyway, but I'll play it.
Okay. Just check with you. Um, Kylie, were you able to see that okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. It was just the sound that was a bit weird, but it was a totally visual thing. So you can see by that that the Tibetans view Yeshi Sogyal as a kind of Christ like figure. So they see her as a fully enlightened being who performed miracles and transformed Tibet. So, so that's the kind of traditional Tibetan view of her and not just Tibetan, also, also Bhutan, Nepalese, Northern Indian view of her. But historically, you know, what do we know? What do we really know? What can be proven about who Yeshi Sogyal was? So there is an, um, there a thing called the Chronicles of Ba, which is a kind of ancient historical text that was produced around 100 years, maybe 150 years after the time that Padmasambhava was in Tibet and that mm -hmm. Yeshi Sogyo was teaching. So um, that, given the close proximity that that chronicle was written to when Yeshi Sogyo was meant to have lived, it's considered to be, you know, fairly historically accurate. So what we know from that was that she was born into an aristocratic family. They say princess, but really, um, you know, if we're being realistic, it was probably more like the daughter of, a, you know, a local landholder, a chieftain or something like that. We know that she had a life of struggle. Let's ask everyone to mute their microphones, please. That's okay, Peter. Got quite a bit of feedback there, though. Thank you. So she had a life of struggle. So the, the little video showed us a little bit of what that was like. But actually, because she was so beautiful, physically beautiful, um, and the daughter of a strong landholding family, you know, and again, remember this is 750. She was seen as an asset to be, you know, bartered essentially to create political connections and, and uh, treaties. A number of competing aristocratic families wanted their sons to marry her. She didn't want to marry anyone. She did not want to be married. She wanted to be a spiritual practitioner she just wanted to practice Dharma. Um, so she refused a number of times to be married. And then one of her potential suitors kidnapped her and was going to try and force her to be married. Um, then another suitor kidnapped her back off of him. And then to resolve the dispute that was threatening to create like drama, Helen of Troy type drama in Southern Tibet, uh, the king said, okay, I will, take her as my consort. So they say she's, she was his, you know, traditionally they talk about Yeshi Sogyal as being like the queen of Tibet, wife of the king, but historically it's probably more likely that she was a junior consort um, and that she entered the royal family as a kind of like a, a way to stop, stop the struggle. But as it turns out, Tristan Detson, the king of the time, really valued her, thought she was kind of amazing. But knowing this is, we're sort of reading between the lines here, knowing that she really just wanted to be a spiritual practitioner. When Padmasambhava came to Tibet, the king saw an opportunity to free her. And, you know, this is kind of a little bit like the unfortunate way that women were treated at the time, but basically offered her to Padmasambhava so that she could have a master and practice. Luckily, that worked out really well. She was terribly devoted to Guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava, um, she went to practice with him. She became his closest student. So we talk about Padmasambhava having 25 close students who all achieved enlightenment. Yeshi Sogyal was the principal one of those 25. She's the main one. She's the one who's considered to have achieved the highest, highest realization. So this is really important in terms of Tibetan Buddhism. We have a woman being the first Tibetan to become a Buddha. We have a woman being Padmasambhava's closest student. We have a woman establishing the Buddhist tradition essentially in Tibet. And then even more kind of important, um, the Dzogchen tradition, which is considered the highest form of Buddhism. Um, it was Yeshi Sogyal who wrote those teachings down and shared them. Without her, we would not have the Dzogchen tradition, which is a Dzogchen tradition, which is the tradition, you know, that is um, most suitable for the West. So we owe her a lot in that sense. Now, you probably mentioned in that little video it had the word terma 
and like Yeshi Sogula is the originator of the Terma tradition. So this is an interesting Tibetan thing. Also, actually, it didn't just happen in Tibet. It happened in Kashmir among Hindus as well, a similar kind of thing. So Padmasambhava deemed that some of the things he taught or wanted to teach or could teach um, were not right for the Tibetans at that time, particularly Zogchen. Um, he felt strongly at that time that Tantra was what um, was going to ground the Tibetans. And that truly is the case. That's truly what has happened. So the Dzogchen teachings and other sort of high practices um, or sort of like special um, practices that he didn't think the Tibetans were ready for yet or the world was ready for yet, he entrusted those to Yeshi Sogyal. She wrote them down and she concealed them. So she literally... Um, the terma that I'm getting the teachings that I'm about to share with you from, she she buried them in a cave near her meditation cave in Chimpu in central Tibet. So literally buried these teachings. And then they were found, you know, later. There's an interesting story about a very high lama by the name of Jamin Kensi Wongpo. Um, he was passing by a collapsed um, temple and an old woman had found... Um, like an object in the rubble. And she thought, Oh, I better give this to a Lama a special. It's a special thing. I better give it to a Lama. So he gave it to, um, it was a statue of the Buddha. He gave it to Jamin Kensi Wongpo, who was just passing at the time. And Jamin Kensi Wongpo just put it in his robes, you know, and left it there while he's riding, I think a horse or a donkey or something. And he proceeded on his journey. And then when he got off the horse or donkey at his destination, that statue fell out of his jacket and smashed open on the ground and hidden inside that statue was a terma, a Zogchen teaching that Yeshi Sogyal had hid, hidden there. So this, you know, so it's interesting that Jamin Kensi Wongpo is labelled the Turton, the person who revealed that teaching. But actually, you know, credit should be with Yeshi Sogyal because she hid it and um, made it so that it could be found in the future. So lots of teachings have been um, revealed in this way. You know, they were hidden and then they're found. So she, she um, went all over Tibet hiding teachings that the Tibetans were not ready for at the time. A lot of what we do in the Nyingma tradition, our particular school, is from the Terma tradition, which originates from Yeshi Sokyo. Okay, so um, remember at the beginning I talked about Yeshi Sokyo being the perfect practitioner, the perfect disciple, and the perfect master, and that um, if we look at those three things, we can then learn some things about the view, meditation and conduct. And remember I said that in the Zogchen tradition, we tend to talk about everything as view, meditation or conduct. We sort of divide things up like that. So um, the view of Tantra, which is um, essentially Tantra is what we, what Tibetan Buddhism is. It's Tantra. You know, you see all these deities, all these quite complicated rituals, all these sort of practices that involve chanting um, and mantras and stuff like that. That is Tantra. It's unique to the Vajrayana or the Tibetan tradition. So the view, which is a philosophical outlook. When we talk about view, we're talking about how we look at the world, how we look at things, phenomena. So the view of Tantra is to see all phenomena as pure, as manifestations within a pure realm. This pure view sees all beings as Buddhas, especially the master, and sees one's own nature as not separate from the Buddha nature. So Yeshi Sogyo is a great example of this. She saw her master, Padmasambhava, as the Buddha himself and behaved towards him as she would behave towards a Buddha. So, and she then also saw the landscape in which she lived, Tibet, as a pure land, everything pure, everything perfect, and every being she encountered from, you know, the dirtiest beggar, to the king, because she was a student, she was a teacher of kings. Um, she saw them all the same. They're all Buddhas. They're all above her. So that's the tantric view. And she exemplified that. If you read her, there's a number of biographies about her. And if you read them, you see that this attitude of hers, of seeing all beings as the Buddha, as seeing the environment in which she moves as a pure land, um, this is really evidenced over and over and over and over again. She, she, she was a master of the tantric view. Now, 
Dzogchen is um, connected to, but not the same as Tantra. So in the view of Dzogchen, um, the view of Dzogchen is to understand with certainty, with no doubt, the true nature of the mind. So again, Yeshi Sogyal is exemplified this. If you read some of her short, pithy instructions to students, they really exemplify this idea um, that we must every day, all day, recognize the true nature of mind and live from that experience. She was the exemplifier of that idea. And some of her teachings about the nature of mind are the best you can find. And in fact, in a lot of, in a lot of um, Dzogchen teachings, um, they're restatements of Yeshi Sogyal's initial statements. And she's, she's paraphrasing her own guru. So it goes all the way back to Padmasambhava. So, so in essence, what Yeshi Sogyu wrote down, you know, there's been, nothing's changed since then. And it's just been passed down over the centuries. It's like 1200 years or something, 1300 years. It's been passed down intact, you know, essentially re just repeating the things she discovered, you know, and no one has found a way to say it better. Okay. So, um, Yeshi Sogyo, when Padmasambhava was leaving Tibet, she asked him to give a final teaching um, as a gift to her um, because she wasn't going to see him again and she was upset about that. Um, and he gave a teaching which has come to be known, the teaching that is all teachings in one. It's really quite short, but it actually does contain everything. So again, this is Padmasambhava teaching his closest disciple, Yeshi Sogyo, who becomes a Buddha. So he says, you may wonder, is mine nothing? So this is about the view. Remember, we're talking about the view, our philosophical attitude of the world. And remember, in Sogchen, we talk about the view as being understanding the true nature of mind. It still shimmers and flashes forth like haze in the heat of the sun. You may wonder, is it something? It has no color or shape to identify, identify it, but it is utterly empty and completely awake. That is the nature of your mind. Having recognized it as such, to become certain about it, that is the view. So this very short instruction summarizes everything we need to know about the nature of the mind. I mean, you could unpack this. We could teach, we could teach on this. We could talk about this. We could discuss this for hundreds of hours. There's a lot of depth hidden in these few sentences, but essentially this view, which is a Zogchen view, this is the first place where we see it. Padmasambhava teaching it to Yeshi Sogyo. And if you think about all the number of practitioners who have attained complete enlightenment over the 1300 years since, and there's been thousands of them, um, it all comes from this moment, this moment where Yeshi Sogyo, as the perfect practitioner, as the perfect disciple, asks the right question at the right time. And the answer she writes down, and then she shares, she says with all her students and then becomes the perfect master. So I'll obviously, um, because this is quite deep, this teaching, um, we could talk about it a lot, but actually what needs to happen is one needs to actually apply what Thomas and Barbara is saying here. We need to look at the mind and understand what it is, what its true nature is. That can only be done in practice through meditation, and through contemplation. So those two things, meditation, shamatha, and a kind of a, um, what we could call vipassana, a questioning or insightful kind of a meditation where we question, okay, what is the mind? What is What are thoughts? What is the mind? And, um, you know, Guru Mishai gives us here the answer, you know, it's utterly empty and completely awake, you know. Those are, those are big concepts, you know. But just having those words is not enough. We need to experience for ourselves the truth of it. So it has to be done in practice. And that's what Yeshi Sogyo did. She practiced what she was taught and she became awakened. And then she taught and helped others to become awakened as well. So now when we move on to meditation, so meditation, you know, we know what meditation is, but basically it's our practice, whatever form that takes. So when we talk about meditation in the Dzogchen tradition, in the Nyingma tradition, or in Vajrayana, it's not necessarily just sitting on a cushion. It can be mantra, it can be 
acts of kindness in the world. In fact, it definitely is acts of kindness in the world. So, but meditation is our practice, whatever form that takes. Okay. In Tantra, usually practice is takes the form of meditating on the pure nature of all things. Remember how we talked about Yeshi Sogyal, seeing her teacher as the Buddha, all beings that she encountered as the Buddha and the land or the space in which she moved as a pure land, right? Um, that's pure, what we call pure view. And that's the point of all these complicated tantric practices where you visualize deities, you know, and you, you know, that you visualize a deity in front of you and then the deity sh sort of shoots rainbow light on you and you transform into the deity. And all of this is a visualization technique to get you to accept what is true, that all things are empty. All things are impermanent. All things have the same taste, right? What is that taste? that taste is perfection. Everything underneath is perfect. So that's a point of Tantra. And that's what most of those practices are. Practicing pure view through meditation. In Dzogchen, the practice is to rest in the true nature of the mind. Really simple until that experience becomes stable. So it takes effort. Like Dzogchen seems sort of simple and easy. It is simple and, but it is not easy. You know, so it, cause it takes time and it takes commitment. Um, you have to sit on your seat and meditate. And you also, you need to look to your mind and understand it, understand what it is and what it's doing. And, um, when you first glimpse the nature of mind, uh, from that moment on, it's inevitable that you become awakened. Right. But you will, quickly slip back into ordinary mind, dualistic mind. So you've got to constantly do this. You've got to constantly train in this so that eventually your ability to rest in the nature of mind, the true nature of mind stabilizes. And what does that mean? It means it becomes permanent. So dualistic mind no longer rises. Thoughts and stuff might rise, but they instantly, what they call self-liberate, they vanish on their own. Um, you don't need to do anything with them or to them. It just all happens naturally because you're abiding in the natural state. <clears throat> so in Dzogchen, that's the practice to rest in the true nature of the mind. And we have a picture there of Yeshi Sogyal and um, Padmasambhava in embrace. And that embrace symbolizes something, the union of wisdom, which is what understanding the empty nature of things and compassion, which is what working tirelessly to benefit sentient beings. So, and that's what we call Yab Yum, uh, I suppose you could call it yin yang, um, but it's union. And interestingly in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, compassion is seen as male and wisdom, the source of compassion, the, you know, the root of everything is female. Yeshi Sogyal represents that in that, in that painting. Okay, so again, we'll return to this teaching that Padmasambhava gave Yeshi Sogyal when he was leaving Tibet. This is about meditation. To remain undistracted in a state of stillness without fabrication or fixation, that is a meditation. So we already talked about that. But here we have in one sentence, the entire Buddhist practice tradition summed up. You know, it's really kind of amazing. Um, and to have these kinds of like direct, simple teachings I don't think we should take them for granted. It seems simple. You read that sentence and it seems so easy and simple, you know, but it's actually really very deep, you know, and our minds don't necessarily, we think we like simple, but in practice, our minds like complicated. We like to be constantly doing stuff. Um, and this um, indicates that actually, you know, all of the stuff that we want to do, we don't need to do it. We just need to remain undistracted in the state of stillness without fabrication or fixation. That's the practice that Padmasambhava advocates to Yeshi Sogyal. And that's the practice she taught in Tibet, which has become the mainstay, the, the, the highest kind of practice in Tibetan Buddhism. So now we'll talk about conduct. So conduct refers to our speech and actions, which are the support for our view and meditation. So in all forms of Buddhism, the main focus of our conduct is ethical living. I'm always banging on about that, especially refraining from harming others. It's really key. 
really super key. Also refraining from harming ourselves. That's really important too. Um, there's a really great kind of single sentence teaching from the Buddha where he basically says to tame the mind, to refrain from harming others. This is the Buddha's teaching. That's it. Tame the mind, understand its nature and don't harm others. It's really very simple. It's, um, but not easy, simple and easy, uh, do not equate, you know, the taming the mind takes time and effort. Refraining from harming others is actually quite difficult. Um, particularly in our current world where it's so easy to be implicated, drawn in, involved in the harm of others without even knowing it, you know? Okay. Now, again, Zogchen has another kind of deeper view of conduct. And in Zogchen, conduct means that whatever we say and do should reflect, support, and strengthen our understanding of the nature of our mind. So when we talk about the nature of the mind being empty, yet aware, right? Not something, but not nothing either. It's tricky. It's a tricky thing. Um, it can sometimes lead people to think that if they're practicing Zogchen, you know, nothing really exists so they can do whatever they want. This is really a big mistake. Um, it's not that nothing exists. It's that nothing exists as we think. There is, there is reality. There are facts, right? But they're not what we think. So our, just, our perception is deeply distorted. So in supporting, you know, and reflecting the true nature of our mind, I think in essence what that means is we should act from our true nature and what is our true nature. I talk about this often when we do our meditation sessions, you know, it has these qualities. The true nature of mind has awareness, stillness, and movement. Movement is thoughts and emotions, right? But the, the purest, the pure movement, the first movement, the natural, you know, I'm not a huge fan of that word, but the natural movement, the primordial movement, you know, of the true nature of mind is compassion, unbound compassion, limitless compassion, Compassion that has no limits and no biases. So we should act from there. And that will reflect, support, and strengthen our understanding of the nature of our mind. Compassion is our true nature. It's, I mean, it's the manifestation of something beyond words. But that's the thing that we can touch, compassion. Compassion. That's the thing that we can enact compassion. And that's the thing that we can understand uh, with words, you know, with our, with our ordinary dualistic minds. So, you know, so that our conduct therefore should always be led by compassion. Really important. All right. Now, Yeshi Sogyol, <clears throat> when I talk about her perfect conduct, she she lived in isolation, in caves, endured hardships for her practice. But she also had no concern for possessions, for things, money and stuff. She had no concern, no interest in reputation or fame. She had no desire for anything other in, than enlightenment for the sake of sentient beings. And so her conduct reflected that. She didn't pursue worldly goods. She didn't pursue worldly status. She acted in kindness to everyone equally. She lived a highly ethical life. You know, these days, we would call her kind of like a no waste, <laughs> no consumption type person. She lived extremely simply, you know, just what she needed to survive and what enabled her to teach, to practice and then to teach. Okay. Now, again, this teaching, the all teachings in one from Pamasambhava to Yeshi Sogyal, um, 
which is the heart or the root or the foundation of the Dzogchen tradition. Padmasambhava says, in that state, to be free from cling or attachment, except, so what state is he talking about? He's talking about resting in the nature of mind. So in that state of resting in the nature of mind, to be free from clinging or attachment, accepting or rejecting, hope or fear, towards any of the experience of the six senses, that is conduct. That is the conduct. And that's Yeshi Sogyo to a T. She did not desire anything, but she feared nothing. She faced death regularly from starvation, from cold, from bandits when she was wandering around alone. You know, so she, she stared the world in the face and did not flinch. You know, she's extraordinary. She's really heroic. So she wanted nothing, but she feared nothing. None of the experience of the six senses, which are, you know, sight, smell, touch, etc., unbalanced her meditation. You know, when we're beginners, you know, when we're sitting in meditation and there's a loud noise, instantly that sense of the noise, it can knock us off our perch and meditation's gone, you know, when we're beginners. Likewise, a smell, likewise, hunger, desire for food can knock you off your perch, you know. None of those things affected her. She remained in the natural state always. So she's a perfect example of conduct. So I just want to, um, we're starting to sort of wind up a little bit now. So I just wanted to go over some more of this teaching that um, Pamasambhav gave to Yeshi Sogyal that she wrote down and that has been passed down over the centuries. Um, this is something that he's, this is the opening of this teaching. So we've sort of, I've been dipping around in it. So I'll just read it out for you. Devoted one. So he's talking about Yeshi Sogyal there. With a faithful and a virtuous mind. Again, he's talking about Yeshi Sogyal. Listen to me. Although there are many profound key points of body, rest free and relaxed as you feel comfortable. So he's talking about the meditation posture, body, speech and mind, meditation posture. Everything is included in, in simply that. Just rest free and relaxed. Although there are many key points of speech, such as breath control and mantra recitation. So he's talking about tantra there. Stop speaking and remain like a mute. So he's just saying, sit still and be quiet. Everything is included in simply that. Although there are many key points of mind, such as concentrating, relaxing, projecting, dissolving and focusing inward. Again, he's talking about tantra there. Everything is included in simply letting it rest in its natural state. So leaving the mind alone, free and easy, without fabrication. So here he sums up the entire Zogchen path in one paragraph. It's quite extraordinary. And he's also saying to her, you know, you, you don't need all this complicated stuff. You don't need all these things. You just need this. Right, but Yeshi Sogyo was act, able to practice in this way, but whether or not we can, that's a whole other question. Whether or not we are able to rest free and relaxed, to sit still and be quiet, you know, and to just leave the mind alone, that's the big one. That's the really hard one. You know, this, this is doubtful. Our minds, to think is to not leave the mind alone. To think is to interfere, to fabricate them in the mind. So you're doing, a lot of times we think thought just comes naturally. It does not. It's produced. It's fabricated. The natural state of the mind is stillness. The natural state of the body is stillness. So just think about that for a little minute. So when we're asleep and the mind is not moving the body, the body is still. The natural state of our speech right? Our energy. So speech is both voice and also the energy that we have is stillness. This is our natural state. Everything we do interrupts that natural state, moving, talking, thinking. These interfere or intervene or cover up or obscure the natural state. So he's essentially saying, do nothing. Don't think don't talk, don't move. Just rest, relaxed, free, doing nothing, okay? Oddly, you would think doing nothing would be easy, but it is not. 
And yet, Yeshi Sogil achieved this quite quickly. And I think some of the teachings say that she achieved this in seven months. She was, now this is a challenge, you know, she did this in seven months. <clears throat> she did a lot of other practices beforehand. So, pro, you know, so set herself up, but she achieved this perfect state resting in the nature in just seven months. So, you know, but she had done a lot of training to set herself up for that. But I think that's inspiring. I think that's encouraging. Even though we haven't done hundreds of hours of meditation, haven't done decades of retreat, you know, we can still do it. It won't be as quick as seven months, but it's not like lifetimes away. It can be done. We can do it because it's really just about stopping, just stopping and resting. And then the true nature of the mind reveals itself. We don't have to do anything. So this is, I think, really inspiring. I find this inspiring. I'll stop now. Otherwise, I'll keep talking about how inspiring it is. Okay. Um, unmute yourselves if you have any questions. Happy to answer any questions you have there. Any questions, anyone? Anyone? Hello, hey. it's Lucinda here. Hi, Lucinda. I didn't even know you were there. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm stealthy. Welcome. Uh, no, thank you so much. I've so enjoyed listening and I'm, I really appreciate hearing you because I feel like that, you know, the, 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 just the truth and the integrity of the history or the facts, whatever information there is, um, is just such a beautiful foundation and I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, I, my You're welcome. question. Oh, thank <laughs> <you>. <laughs> so my, my question is, uh, look, it's something about, all right, for those of us who have a bit of a, an achievement um, strive in us, and mm. I have that mm. in my everyday life, you know, how many, mm. yeah, yeah, how yeah. many projects can I succeed at? And You're so a high on. achiever, yes. Well, in some ways, you know, thank you for that, but I'm also bloody lousy at practice and I acknowledge that too. Um, but it, it's this weird thing of uh, kind of the achievement ethics of practice. Mm. For example, I, you know, my doctor is currently extremely angry at me for not eating meat lately and it's apparent in my blood and I've got some, you know, some fairly serious health problems at the moment and so on. So my doctor is saying you must eat meat, for example you know an example of um you know trying so hard and when you have um uh you know such an iconic figure as you've been discussing today of, of this absolute um you know self-sacrificial just being no ego no grasping no and and yet achieving this um spiritual perfection in practice you know how do, how does one weigh that up with one's own oh, day-to-day life in, yeah in okay so temporary world yeah so we'll just address the meat thing first because i think a lot of people have this issue yeah particularly women have this issue with meat yeah so mm. yeshi sogyo was not a vegetarian as far as i i know okay padmas and baba was and yeah. he, when he went to Tibet, he said, I'm not teaching any of you Tibetans until you give up meat. <laughs> so he really laid down the law, right? Yeah, yeah. But then, um, but then we have evidence that Yeshi Sogyo ate a little bit of meat. Yeah. So, so that, the first okay. thing I would like to say about this is um, the Buddha laid down these rules about meat eating very clearly. You know, if you are not involved directly in the killing of the animal, then you can eat the meat. And as an example, my beloved partner's guru, he was in a cave in Tibet, I think in the 30s or 40s or something like that. And he found a deceased um, and he, you know, he didn't have any money. And he didn't have any mm. food. He was just mm. living like a wild yogi with no clothes and dreadlocks you know, yeah. in, a, in a cave. Yeah. And um, he found a carcass of a deer or something that had been mm. killed by a leopard, a snow leopard. And so mm. he was taking some of that meat to eat. Now, according mm. to his teaching, that's fine, right? Because he's had no involvement in the death of that animal. But then yes. the snow leopard came back and chased him away. And so he's like, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm, I'm too attached to food. I'm going to let this go. But that's, that's like um, not what you need to do. All you need to do is do your best, however you work that out, 
is totally up to you. There's no judgment. Like that's the other thing. Judgment is not Buddhism. Judgment is something else. Like, yeah, I think that's what I have to work through. Yeah. 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 But in terms okay. So, I mean, I tend to be answering people's questions about meat a lot lately. I don't know why that is. It's just suddenly this year, there's lots of questions about it, but anyway, so if your health requires you to do that, then you have to do that because you're of no value to humans and other animals, right? If yeah. you're not well, this is really, really important. We yeah. call our, the foundation of Dharma practice is our precious human life. So, okay. yeah. and that precious human life has some qualities. One of them is good health, right? So what you need to do to maintain your health, you need to do. So, um, so that's that. Now, the other thing is, the thing about practice is you just do what you can and you, because this is the thing, you know, Jetsma Tenzin Pamo, the um, British-born Tibetan nun, she says, and Guru Mshay would totally back her up, it's about a little every day rather than like a lot every now and then. Yes, so, yes. So, and honestly, and in the Dzogchen tradition, we would suggest start off really quite small, you know, like five minutes, you know, mm. a day. And this is the thing you can, you can stop, place your awareness on your breathing mm. just for like one or two in and out cycles, you know, and just for that few seconds, you stop, you place your awareness on your breathing and you just kind of, I mean, with a bit of practice of just doing that a few breaths at a time, you will start to drop into calm. The minute you place your awareness on your breathing, of course, when we're agitated and stuff like that, it's harder. But if you get the habit of just doing a little bit, five minutes here and there, you know, it will build. And the thing is about consistent and persistent. So if you have five minutes a day or two minutes a day in time, it will build, it'll build and build and build. And in just that couple of minutes, you'll be able to touch base with calm, with the stillness that is inside all of that activity. And that's enough. And then you just mm. quick, you just quickly dedicate that just mm. for the sake of all sentient beings. Yes. You know, honestly, it's not about quantity. Mm, mm, that was a really affirming answer. I'm grateful for that answer. It really affirms, you know, where I'm at in the path that I'm attempting. Thank you. Mm. And don't forget, um, there's a re really amazing couple of um, their brothers, actually, monks. Um, one's deceased now, one's still alive. In Amer in a, they live in America, but they're Tibetan. They're students of my teacher. Now, they said this really beautiful thing, which is, and of course, true. <laughs> uh, every act of kindness connects us with our true nature. Mm. So every little thing mm. connects us with our true nature because they're indivisible. It might not, we might not think that the wisdom of emptiness and, you know, just giving a buck to a beggar is the same, but they're the same. Anytime you let go of something you're hanging on to. So anytime you're generous, anytime you're kind, you know, Mm, you connect mm, with your true mm. nature and that builds again on over time. Yeshi Sogyal is an example of someone who fully threw herself at it, but there's another way to throw yourself at it. The way my Lama did it, he didn't do a lot of retreats. He, he, he didn't live an austere life at all. He had a lot of loss in his life though, but he didn't have an, he didn't live an austere life. Mm. He lived a totally normal life. Mm. He had a wife and kids and she left him and took everything. And I tell this story a fair bit because I think it's hilarious. And he did nothing about that. He mm -hmm. was in an empty house with nothing until his students worked out, hang on a minute, he's living in an empty house with nothing. So then they, you know, they helped him to refurnish. But he lived a totally normal life. But he'd reacted to loss in a different way to us. He reacted mm. to change in a different way to us. So then he got married again and he had some more kids. You know, he traveled a lot. He taught a lot. He liked things. He had pleasures. There's, this is another way to do it. If you can foster non-attachment 
in your ordinary life, you know, which is what about what just dropping into that stillness every now and then and recognizing yeah. that all this is imp impermanent, you know, these two mm. things, compassion or kindness and impermanence, really getting that. Mm. They'll chew you along quite fast. And you, mm. don't, you don't need to go and retreat for that. You don't need to be an austere bejo for that. You mm. don't need anything but your life. Your life is what it will be, you know. But the other thing is, any sense that you're not okay, that you have to drop. Mm, that's the bit I have to work on. Mm. it's easy mm. to drop, but it will come back. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to drop it again and again and again until there's none of it left. This yeah. is the thing. The Buddha said, all sentient beings, and what's a sentient being? A sentient being is a, is a being that's aware of itself, aware that it exists, right? All sentient beings are the same as him. And we venerate the Buddha. We adore the Buddha. The Buddha saved billions of lives, right? In, indirectly and directly. He equalized men and women in India at a time when women were being abused, tortured, killed, murdered, sold. Mm. You know, he totally equalized that. He, he abolished slavery within his community. He abolished the caste system within his community. At that time, this is unheard of. You know, why did he mm. do it? Why did he do it? Because he was awake to his true nature. His true nature is compassion. And you're the same. So any sense that you're not that, you have to drop it. And you don't have to like work on that thing, on that bad feeling, on that negativity. Just remind yourself. In my true nature, I am perfect. And then you drop into a couple of minutes of just breathing, you know, and touch that stillness. Understand that the perfection is already there. It's already there. So that's really all it is. It's not about working on each negative thought or each negative behavior or sort of abandoning or dropping or fixing or anything. It's just drop into stillness for a few minutes by, you know, just reconnecting with the breath every day and remind yourself, just cognitively remind yourself, all beings in their nature are the same as the Buddha, as am I. Perfect. Mm. As I am, without any change or modification. There's this thing that we, you know, oh, we need to modify and change. No. Nah. We need to stop the shit, all the mm. modifying and changing that we're doing, which is just messing it up. We just need to stop and be as we are. As we are, mm. we're perfect already. No need to do mm. anything. Mm. It's very simple, but not that easy. Have I helped uh, answer your question? So, so much so that I'll probably call you in the middle of the night and you can tell me to drop things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was a beautiful answer. Thank you so much. You, you, you know, what I think is useful is, Writing it on a piece of paper and sticking yeah. it on the wall. We do <laughs> so that here. Yeah. So you know, I, call you. Yeah. I go into the bed, my partner's bedroom, and on his walls, he's got all these great pith instructions, Sogchen pith instructions. And yeah. he changes them as his practice changes, you know. But yeah. often I walk in and some, some, something will be like, this too will pass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, Sticky label. Yeah. yeah. Drop it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. All this yeah. sort of stuff. So I think that's very helpful technique yeah. thank you so much you're welcome any other questions no all right i think we'll wind it up then if we've got no more questions oh hang on i'll just check the messages thing Okay, all good. So we'll wind it up now. I'm just going to do a little dedication. By this effort, may all beings abide in the bliss of the great perfection. Om Mahom, Om Mahom, Om Mahom. Om Mahom, Om Mahom, Om Mahom.
All right, everybody, thank you very much.